marketing for less than a year, and they're already selling almost as much. Um, so that's what people do with things that copy themselves. Of course, as far as RepRap's concerned, people, as soon as the design's out there, start making variations on it. And again, this is just some th stuff that I downloaded from Thingiverse uh, when I was putting this talk together. These are all variations on the standard design of the machine that people have posted back on the web. And things that copy themselves are, of course, necessarily subject to Darwin's law of evolution. Uh, and there will be random mutations that occasionally happen in the software or the hardware. And those might just conceivably be improvements. But the thing that really drives the evolution of the machine is much, something much closer to the idea of selective breeding, the thing that we did to turn the wolf into the dogs, um, in that it's consciously driven by people saying, I want this bit to look like that. Um, and that was what will really drive the evolution of the machine forward. So we've got improvement by breeding. Uh, one of the things to note, incidentally, is that old machines can make new designs. Um, I mentioned that Eric's machines over there are the first design that we did. This is the second design. Uh, this is my own personal machine that I have at home. Uh, I also have a machine at home just like the first design. Um, and all the RepRap parts of this machine were made in my first machine at home. Uh, so you've got a new design for the machine. You happen to have an old machine. You can use that old machine to make the latest design. And one of the principles of the project that we're going to stick to is that design n is always going to be manufacturable by design n minus 1. It may well be that design 10 can't be manufactured by design 1, but there will always be a continuous chain through all the versions of it so that you can get to the latest design from wherever you are. And of course, um, my slightly stretched biological analogy, this is a little bit like horizontal gene transfer in that you've got old machines acquiring information that's been the product of an evolutionary process and use that information to upgrade themselves. Um, what are the sorts of things that people are going to do to improve the design of the machine? Uh, well, they're going to make it faster. Eric's already working on that. Uh, this is really important. Make it simpler for people to put it together. Uh, at the moment, you have to be a person rather like all of us in this room to put one of these machines together. Ideally, we'd like to get it to the point where a reasonably technically competent but not technically highly educated person can put the entire machine together and get it working. Uh, make it more accurate. At the moment, it's accurate to about 0.1 of a millimeter. If you can improve that, we can make things more precisely, of course. Uh, fewer added in parts. I mentioned about half the bits you have to buy externally to put into the machine. We obviously want to reduce that proportion. And indeed, there's a prize now available for $80,000 from the Foresight Institute, just been announced, uh, to improve RepRap, to increase the proportion of parts that it can print itself. So if you want to go out and design a new machine and have a crack at that prize, excellent. Go for it. Slightly more abstract biological point. Um, this is really how I came by the idea for the entire machine. Um, and uh, I just wanted to spend a few moments talking about it. Um, we're all familiar with the phenomenon that to lay people is called symbiosis. Biologists don't call it symbiosis, they call it mutualism. So let's stick with the technically correct term. Um, symbiosis, incidentally, just means any relationship between two species. So, for example, example, lions and antelope have a symbiotic relationship. The antelope probably doesn't appreciate it that much, um, but um, they do uh, from a biological perspective. By mutualism, uh, biologists mean a um, um, relationship of mutual benefit. And, of course, we all know the primary example of this, the one that we're all taught at school, is the relationship between the flowering plants and the insects. Uh, this evolved about 130 million years ago in the late Jurassic, and it's been going from strength to strength ever since. Uh, and the way it works, of course, is that the, in, the flower needs to get its pollen to another flower, but it can't move. Uh, so it makes nectar, which is of no use to the plant directly, but the insect values the nectar. The insect visits the plant to gather the nectar, gets pollen deposited on itself, goes to the next plant, the pollen gets transferred. Both species gain a benefit from this relationship. Um, both of them are happy, and both of them are thereby allowed to survive better than they would otherwise. And, of course, human beings take part in many symbiotic relationships. Uh, we have a symbiotic relationship with the material that we eat, which may sound a bit like the lion and the antelope, except some of these species are incredibly successful as a consequence of this symbiosis. Uh, for example, corn. Um, if we look at it from the corn's perspective, corn has managed to enslave another species 
get it to clear vast tracts of land for the benefit of the corn. Um, when the corn gets sick, we go to the nearest spaceport, we throw a satellite into orbit, we take its photograph, we fly over it and distribute drugs to make it better. Um, at the end of the season, we gather a sample of its children away and store them most carefully in cold, dry conditions so that it can get a head start in the next... We don't do this for our own children, for heaven's sake. Um, so uh, the corn just has to sit there and grow. Um, chick chickens... Chickens are the most successful bird in evolutionary history in terms of numbers. There are 15 billion chickens on Earth. Um, and the reason for that is simply because they have a symbiotic relationship with the most powerful organism that has ever lived. And, of course, flour and eggs together make cake. Um, and so we've got a direct analogy here. We get the cake, and the corn and the chickens get to reproduce preferentially. Oh, right, I've got to get on. Time's up. Um, anyway... A mutual evolutionary stable strategy uh, is uh, what's been established by the flowers and insects, and it's a stable Nash equilibrium. RepRap is the same in that the machine is equivalent to the flowers, the people are the equivalent to the insects, and the goods that the machine make with that the people value is the equivalent to the nectar. And so it seemed to me that the machine ought to have a stable relationship with human beings in exactly the same way as the flowers and insects have a stable relationship. Um, we all know that's the wrong way around. The arrow of time actually goes the other way, of course. Instinctively, we know that from our intuitive feeling for entropy. Um, however, occasionally the arrow of time appears to go backwards, and of course it's evolution that drives that process, and it does so by expending energy, so it doesn't break the laws of thermodynamics, in fact. Um, everything on the left gets replaced by the stuff on the right. You can all remember, I'm sure, buying photographic film in rolls, I bet none of you can remember, well, one or two of you probably can, can remember the last time you bought a roll of photographic film. There'll be a, usually a show of four hands at the moment of nutters who still use film. But um, there we go. Okay, what of the future? Well, you all run your own CD dressing plant, uh, your own photographic lab, and your own printing press. And, of course, you do it all courtesy of these devices. Um, why shouldn't you run your own factory? that makes more factories. That's all I've got to say. There's the website if you want to have a look. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Has, uh, how long have we got for questions? Or any time? A couple of minutes. OK. Um, yeah, if anyone's got a question. Yep. Oh, right. Sorry, I, I stand corrected. Um, clearly, they must, be, they must really exist, and the second law of thermodynamics is nonsense, as demonstrated by eBay. Um, anyone else? Sorry, Sorry I, louder. Yep. Uh, well, there are two ways we can go about printing PCBs. Um, we're not quite... Uh, I, I had, sorry, for everybody else's benefit, he said, what about other materials, in particular printing PCBs? Um, there are two ways we think that they might be possible to make PCBs. Um, one is a fairly obvious way of putting a cutting head in the machine and milling the PCBs. And I've actually got a design for that, which I haven't finished. I mean, need to get on with it, uh, that will use a Dremel and the flexible extension cable you can get with the Dremel to allow you to mill a PCB in the machine. Um, that would make a conventional PCB, and that should work fairly straightforwardly, I think. Um, the other and more interesting way is to have a material that's electrically conductive and to deposit that with the machine. And in fact, I've just taken on a research student to work on precisely that problem and other problems. Um, he's already got several conducting pastes, and he's got the design for a paste extruder that was based on the paste extruder called the Frostruder that the MakerBot guys did. Um, and so we'll be putting those together in the fairly near, fairly near future. Uh, whether they actually allow us to make a PCB that works is something that'll be interesting to see. But um, 